let's go ahead and do our, our I was going to pray first, but we'll do our confession and then we'll get right into the word. Amen. <clears throat> you ready? This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I thank you, Lord, for your word. The power, living, double-edged sword. Lord, as we hear your word today, I pray that this Holy Spirit we were singing about would come upon us, Father. That you would cause revelation, Lord. That you would cause a a washing of our minds, Lord, and a cleaning of our hearts, Lord. In the name of Jesus this morning, Father, we thank you, Lord, as you use me to deliver your word, Lord. It are your words that are powerful, not my own, Lord. So I pray that you would use me as an instrument in your hands to deliver this word today, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your promises. Thank you, Lord, that you're not a man that you should lie. Thank you, Lord, that these things that are going to be spoken are truth and powerful, Father. And they're going to change who we are so that we would truly never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Palm Sunday, Christ the Passover Lamb. So we're going to read Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, and then you're going to go, huh? So hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. See, as a, as a parent, we make promises to our children. So I remember when our kids were small, and uh, we used to go to Disney quite a bit. Uh, when we were more when we were in Miami than now that we're only 45 minutes away or 30 minutes away we used to go a lot when we were in Miami we'd tell them oh we're going to Disney and then we would say we're going to go Saturday but when they're small they don't know what Saturday is or you know so every day is today Saturday are we going today are we going to Disney when are we going to Disney right for however many days then we caught on and realized we're not going to tell them anything until the day that we're leaving right so that way they leave us alone but that's what happens that you tell them something great and you tell them that something's about to happen that they're going to enjoy something that's going to be a blessing to them and what happens is they want to know when that day is coming as kids that's how they are do you know that we're still like that as grown-ups right when the day finally comes it's like a tree of life But until it comes, it's hope deferred, and it makes your heart sick. You're constantly disappointed. Proverbs 13, verse 12 in the message, the same scripture in the message, it says, unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick, but a sudden good break can turn life around. How many of you know that's what we, we need, a sudden good break? Right? Things have been dark way too long. Things have been going in the wrong direction way too long. Right? We need that break. We need something to to really break through. Well, I'm going to tell you that in the spirit, I've been sensing that something is on its way. We just need to put our faith into this, and something is about to happen. And the Lord was speaking to me a couple days ago about how we don't hang on. We're not people that have that faith grit. If you've been here long enough, you know I've taught on faith, and I always use John Wayne as an example, right? True grit. you got to have grit to be a a, a person of audacious kind of faith, where you believe for stuff like they did when the sun stood still and the the sea opened up, right? And they believed for healing, and healings would happen. When we used to have those old-time tent meetings, and people would come in and leave, and their wheelchairs would still be inside the tent. Well, that used to be. Now... What we don't have is grit. What we don't have is that hanging on. Why? Because every time something doesn't happen exactly how we want it to, it's hope deferred. Right? We're disappointed, and it makes our hearts sick. But if we just hung on, because many times we give up, and the blessing and the answer is right around the corner. It's right there. We just don't see it yet. But if God said it, it has to happen, right? When God makes a promise, he keeps it. That day when the desire comes, it will be a day of celebration. We look at uh, Numbers uh, 23, verse 19, New King James Version. I'm getting there. I know you guys are going, I thought this was Palm Sunday. 
God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do, or has he spoken and will he not make good? See, this this word, I'm going to talk about disappointment on Easter morning. Uh, I have a little section there, and we're going to talk about disappointment. Disappointment is me uh, missing your appointment. It's the it's that gap between what you expect and reality, right? It's that that disappoint. Well, God is not disappointed in you, and we're gonna we're gonna expand on that uh, uh, next Sunday. But God is not disappointed in you because He already knows. He already knows that we're going to do good. He already knows that we're going to fail. He already knows that we're, he already knows. So he can't be disappointed in you. And knowing all that, he still sent his son Jesus to die for you. Knowing that you weren't going to be perfect, that you were going to fail, that you were going to do some things that you shouldn't do, he still sent Jesus knowing all those things. Why? Because he is not disappointed in us. Right? He loves us. Look at Numbers 23, 19, and God's word translation says, God is not like people. He tells no lies. He's not like humans. He doesn't change his mind. When he says something, he does it. When he makes a promise, he keeps it. He doesn't go, oh, I didn't expect that. I didn't see that coming. God doesn't do that. He wouldn't be God. He's all-knowing. So he knows it all, right? He knows. He's omniscient. He knows everything. Over 3,000 years ago, God made some promises to his people. Imagine having to wait 3,000 years to go to Disney. 3,000 years, the Israelites, and those promises are in effect for you today. So let's look at these God's four core promises, all the promises of God. There's 7,500 plus promises in the Bible. They center around these four promises, Exodus Chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. You should have these uh, on your notes if you came through the door and and the greeter should have handed you these notes so you'll have them uh, in front of you and the the scripture should be behind us also. So Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 and 7 says, Therefore, say to the Israelites. You guys, I, I, I what? Were you guys here last week? I am. I am the Lord. I am the El Shaddai. Not the Elohim, the El Shaddai. Elohim is the title we gave him. You want to know about that? You need to watch last week's. And I will bring you out. Everybody say, I will bring you out. Come on. I will bring you out, right, from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And here's the second one. I will free you. Ready? One, two, three. I will free you from being slaves to them. Here's the other one. Ready? I will redeem you. With an outstretched arm and with a mighty axe of judgment. Here goes the other one. I will take you as my own people. That's the big one. And I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. I am. I am the I am. The Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Four promises he made. And thank God they're in effect today. We're on the other side of these promises. Number one, I will bring you out. That's salvation. Number two is I will free you. See, freedom or deliverance uh, is getting you out. Salvation gets you out of Egypt. Deliverance gets the Egypt out of you. Sometimes you say, well, that guy's a Christian. He gave his life to the Lord. He made the confession. And look how he still behaves because you haven't been delivered yet. You haven't realized that the deliverer lives inside of you. You haven't realized that the power of the Holy Spirit lives inside of you to change who you are. And, you know, I I say it this way. Number one was to free you, right, to get you saved. And you know how many people you invite to church and say, oh, no, I got some things I got to change. I got stuff I got to do, you know, before I can walk into the church. That's backwards. That's backwards. You have to be in church. Only God can help you through those things. Believe me, I tried everything else. Number three, my mom laughs. I will redeem you, right? Restoration. Does any of this sound familiar to anybody on the ends here? Anybody, you know, I I put our our, uh, vision up there for a reason, right? I will redeem you. I will take you as my own people. This is fulfillment. My people who are called by my name, my people. See, 
we read these scriptures and we go right past those parts that really are powerful. God calls us his people. My people. That's possession. Right? God gave and paid for us to be part of his family. We are his. He is our father. So powerful. God took these four promises and tucked them right into what we call the Passover. So what is Passover? We're going to go through this real quickly. Moses tries to free his people from Pharaoh, hardens the heart. God sends the 10 plagues. You guys are familiar with some of these stories? Even if you're not a Christian and haven't been in, in church, it, this, some of this stuff should, should sound like, I've heard that before. Uh, the 10th one was the big one, right? Every firstborn, every firstborn male is going to die tonight. Moses gathers his people. Moses gathers his people. Moses gathers his people. There was an assembly of the people of God. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're here this morning, but imagine missing this service. It's so nice outside. I'm going to go kayaking. <laughs> I knew I was going to get him. He's here, so don't worry. It's so nice outside. I'm going to go to the park. Next week's Easter, and I always go Easter. And I'm there on Christmas, but I always go. And God shows up and gives those who were present a message. You have to go kill a lamb and take the blood and put it on the doorpost because when this cloud comes over your house, your firstborn son's going to die. And they run home and do exactly what God had spoken to them through Moses. But those that weren't present, the cost of not showing up to this assembly was their firstborn son. I'll leave that there. So Moses gathers his people, right? And uh, uh, anyone who, who has the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, the death angel will pass over. There's the word. Pass over them. Uh, you and your, first, for, uh, your firstborn son will not die. So they exit Egypt in the Red Sea parts, and God gives the Ten Commandments. But not only Ten Commandments, but God institutes over 600 different instructions. In those instructions, God gives them specific instructions on how to live their lives. One of the instructions or of the law was that they needed to learn how to relax. And God institutes that they have seven parties every year. We ain't partying that much. What's going on? We need to follow the law. All of a sudden, the law don't sound so bad. Right? Party! These parties are feast where they ate a lot of food and enjoyed themselves. Now, let me, let, me, let me take a little side note here. Within these parties and these feasts, they would bring offerings. And within these offerings, you can read uh, 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 through most of the Old Testament. You'll see this several times in the law. As they meet for these feasts, they would bring either uh, uh, something to, to kill or they would bring an offering to the feast because it was part of the party, an offering unto God. And they had to institute laws for these offerings. Do you know why they instituted these laws? Because people were giving too much. What? People were giving too much. They were bringing, they loved the Lord. Oh, man, we, we sold property this, this. And back then the law said if you sold your property, and back then there wasn't mortgages and stuff. You bought property, you know. It was yours. You bought it, and there was, you didn't owe the person anything. It was yours. And when you sold it, uh, it wasn't a tithe of it. It was 50% of your property. Remember the, uh, uh, they, Adonias and Sapphira, and they fell over, right? It wasn't because they didn't bring all of their offering. It was because they lied to this Holy Spirit. You understand that? Listen, if one of you didn't give your tithe and you dropped dead here, the rest of you would be writing checks, okay? So... <laughs> It would work, and I, I pray that God would not do that, you know, well, maybe to, at least, no, no, none of you, none of you. I wouldn't want any of you to die here. That's just, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> right, so they, were, they had to institute these laws and these things so people wouldn't give so much. Do you know, we're on the other side of that now. 
We have to explain and show that the blessings of God comes when you remove mammon out of the way and you're able to give according to his word, which is tithes, offerings, and alms. All three has to be done. I'm not teaching that today. And by the way, I'm mentioning this, but we're not picking up another offering, so don't think that that's why I'm doing that, right? But he took these uh, and made seven parties every year. These parties were feasts where they ate a lot of food and enjoyed themselves. So one of those parties was the Passover. So God gives them specific instructions for this Passover party in Exodus chapter 12. Let's go to verse 26. And when your children ask you, You know, we run right through some of these little three or four word phrases in the Bible, and we don't realize how important this is. When your children ask you, if you're not teaching your children to be better Christians than you ever were, we're recycling Christianity. That's what we do. We recycle it. Oh, this is how we do Christianity? Yeah, this is how we teach our kids to do it. Then they go 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years doing the same thing. And then, right? And then we just recycle it. No, our ceiling should be their floor. We should take the next generation and make them better Christians than we ever could be. Because we've passed something on to them. And they take that and go to the next. But what do we do? We criticize them. We pull them down. We keep them. Because we've created a bubble of what Christianity is. And if they don't fit inside that square, then, uh, then you're not really a Christian. But that's all us. That's not biblical. That's stuff that we do. Things that we institute. We say all these other denominations, the Catholics and the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the Methodists, they have these things they do, traditions that they pass on. And they do these things. And, you know, we're Christians. Do you know how many traditions we have in the Christian church? You know how many things we've done in the name of the Holy Spirit that had nothing to do with the Holy Spirit? A lot. I've been part of all those movements. And it wasn't the Holy Spirit at all. At least not the one the Bible mentions. And when your children ask you, see, you should be passing this on to your children as they did. The only reason that we got to the point of Jesus coming in uh, on that day on Palm Sunday and then being uh, uh, crucified and resurrected three days later was because they passed it on to their children. You end Malachi and you start Matthew, there's 400 years of silence. God did not speak to anybody or anything. It's as if he wasn't even there, like he wasn't present. But for 400 years, they passed it on to their children and their children's children and their children's children, and when they get to the Gospels, everyone was still, still waiting on the Messiah. Still waiting. We can't get past 10 years. These people talking 400 years of silence. Yet because their parents and these, the the, the Jewish people said, we're going to pass this on until he comes, because God made a promise. We can't hang on for five minutes. Oh, you prayed, you put your hands on me, but it still hurts. Oh, you put your, I went to the doctor and he says, I still have it. You pray for me. We can't even hang on for a couple of minutes a day, a couple of days. These people hung on for 400 years and their faith brought the Messiah because they were still believing. When your children ask you, if your children aren't asking you, then you're not a very good, well, no, let's not say that. Sorry, Lord. I don't want to be offensive. If your children are not asking you, then you have to be a better representation of who God is. Because there should be a question there. Why do we do this? Why do we go to church? And I would just say, we, you know, because my mom and dad did. We go to church all because, no, answer the question. We go to church because we experience God six days a week. And on the seventh day, we gather all together to experience God as a group, as an assembly. See, church is not the one day that you show up to experience God. That would be sad. You experience God six days a week, and then we gather to celebrate everything that God did over the six days. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. And let me turn that back around. You don't experience God six days a week so good that you say, I don't have to go to church. Right? Because if you don't assemble and you're not part of the body... Come on, if you want to use Old Testament types and shadows, those that weren't part of, of, of those who left Egypt, right, in the wilderness, they were swallowed up by the ground, 250,000 of them. Swallowed up by the, by the ground. And then the snakes came. And those who didn't look upon the, 
the serpent on the rod, the type of Christ. Those who didn't look upon that died too. I don't know why the Lord's leading me in this way today. Hopefully it's, I'll be nicer next week. I'll be nicer next week. I'll be nicer next week. What does this ceremony mean to you? So the kids are asking, what does this mean to you? Why are we doing this? Then they tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. See, during this party, they would explain the purpose for the party to their children. They would kill a lamb, and this would include four cups that they would have on the table. Does that sound familiar? A lamb and a cup of wine, bread and juice. <laughs> when they drank from the cups, they would read from Exodus 6 and explain how each cup represented God's four core promises. I will bring you out, I will free you, I will redeem you, and I will take you as my own people. Son, daughter, this is why we do this. This is why we do this. We encourage you. Well, some, somebody came and said, well, how come we don't have communion all the time at church? How come we don't have, well, we used to, and it became a, a, just the thing that we do. So I said, well, let's do it on special occasions when the word you know, ask for it when it's something, when the Lord leads us and we, we do it like we're going to do it Friday night. We could have done it today, actually. But I said, no, we're going to do it Friday night. So it doesn't become a, just a thing that we do. Right? The Jewish people have been celebrating Passover for 1,400 years. Then Jesus comes to fulfill these promises. But the people were still asking, is this the day? Is this it? Hope deferred. Woo! He's coming. Matthew 21, 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt to her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Let, let me, let, I'm going to mark that I stopped there. Remind me, I stopped at the end of three, right? There's so much in these couple of passages, it's incredible. So he goes in and he asks, he needs a donkey. This, this is what he's getting. He's getting a donkey, right? He's asking for a donkey. So he goes in to get this donkey. And, you know, uh, uh, I believe, I think it was Pastor Tyler uh, called me once and said, you know, I heard a, a preaching about uh, a man, he said that Jesus was rich, that he was a millionaire. I said, well, and, and I said, what else did the, did the preacher teach? And, no, that's it, that he was rich. And I was like, well, that's only half the truth. See, Jesus had access to everything he ever needed. Finances, donkeys, food, right? He would say, go and prepare this and go and tell this guy that, and people would do it. Some of those that surrounded him and, and went and came with him were rich and offered to provide things for him yet he said i am not i have no place to lay my head you sure you want to do this see jesus chose to live the life that he did so he could reach every person that ever came in contact with him because as a rich person yeah he could have reached some people but some people would have said in those times even more because the rich people weren't you weren't allowed to even associate with them they were we do it now. We segregate each other, right? And we live in different neighborhoods, and we drive different cars. We shop in different stores because we have some have money and some don't. I have, you know, if I had money, I think I'd still go to Aldi's, right? <laughs> Probably would never step foot in Walmart again. But Aldi's, Aldi's, <laughs> Aldi's, I would definitely do. Walmart at midnight is better than TV, I'll tell you what. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, Mount Olives, Jesus sent his disciples saying, go to the village, right? And he said, not only get the donkey, but get its what? See, and, and listen very carefully. This is something that I didn't know when the Lord called us into full-time ministry. But I, when the Lord called me and that, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me so strong, I said, Lord, I am not going to drag my family into ministry. 
My kids will hate church. They'll hate ministry. I am not going to do that. So you have to speak to my wife. You have to speak to all three. Ricky was little. You have to speak to all my children. If not, I am not going to go to Bible school, and I'm not going to do what you're asking me to do because I know that you would not ask me to do this. This is a perfect example. He could have, all he needed was the donkey. <laughs> right? All he needed was the donkey. All he needed was me. But he said, not just you, but her and your three kids. Bring the colt. Bring the colt with you. He wasn't going to separate that donkey from its baby. And if an animal meant that much to him, how much more are we, sons and daughters of God? When you serve the Lord, it's not to deny your family, but it's to bring your family with you. And God will speak to all of them. That's our testimony. The Lord spoke to my wife, to my kids, all the way down to my son. He packed the backpack, said, we're leaving, right? And he didn't know anything. Erica had a dream. I mean, my kids were hearing from the Lord as before we even packed and left. Find a donkey tied there, the colt. If anyone says that anything to you, right, he had access to anything he wanted. He was Jesus. Number four, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on, the, on them for Jesus to sit on. A very, and so not only did he ride the donkey and the colt was right next to him and it was even covered and everything. It was part of the whole procession. We always see him on the donkey, but we don't realize the donkey had its colt with her. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Yes. Sounds nice, right? Sounds like they're celebrating. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up and asked, who is this? Wait a minute. Weren't they just saying that he was Hosanna, the son of David? Weren't they just saying, right? They were waiting for, and then he finally makes it in. He's riding on this donkey. And then they asked the question. Who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from, from Nazareth in Galilee. Why did they ask that question? Who is this? Because the Son of God, the Messiah, was going to show up to set up his government. He was going to be a general. He was going to be large and in charge. And someone like that does not ride a donkey. Someone like that comes in on what? <laughs> right? He comes in on a horse, and a great big strong horse too, right? And they gallop in, and they, right? And they were cheering, and then as he came through, they were like, who's that? It's almost like, like a surprise party, and they walk through the door, and everybody goes, surprise, and it's the wrong person. <laughs> who's that? Were they even invited to the party? Who is this guy? He came in on a donkey, aren't you? And Hosanna means save us now that's what they were yelling save us now why because they were children of parents that told them about the four cups and the promises that god had for them and that he was going to deliver them he was going to save them he was going to free them right and he was like this is the time this is what we've been hearing about our whole lives who's that who's this guy on a donkey listen I have, a, I have a, a, a vivid imagination. It's a donkey that's never been ridden, as it says in one of the translations, right? Can you imagine getting on a, a horse or even a donkey that's never been ridden? He's not going to like that very much. And then they show Jesus with his legs off to the side like this sideways because he's wearing his gown. And he's, he's riding his, his donkey, in, right? Oh, no. He's on a donkey that's never been ridden. And they're all going, Hosanna, the son of David, who is that guy? The whole city was stirred up. Yes. Think about it. You guys don't think that way, or am I the only one? 
I'm the only one. My wife says I'm the only one. See, his arrival is consistent with his whole role as the sacrificial lamb, the sacrificial savior. But do you know that he is going to come back? He is going to set up his government. He's going to return on a... Oh, you guys are reading Revelations. Ooh, that's dangerous, right? He's, we're coming, and we're going to be with him. These horses are going to have wings. Come on. We're coming back on a horse with him. He's going to set up his government. That hasn't happened yet, has it? Hope deferred. Hosanna, save us now. They have been waiting for the promise for 1,400 years, and now after seeing all the miracles that he had done and realizing that he was the Messiah, they thought, today is the day the promise is fulfilled. Save us now. But he came into Jerusalem, spent days teaching in parables and preparing them for his crucifixion and resurrection. One of the parables is, you know, this temple will be destroyed and in three days. Right? I will rebuild it. And they're like, what? The promise was so close at his triumphant entry, but their hope was still deferred for eight more days. Just eight more days. Do you see? They were expecting something, and it didn't happen. And all they have, all they have to do now is wait eight more days. At this point, I just got to wait because he's going to resurrect, and he will prove that he is son of the almighty God. Son of El Shaddai. He's the son that came. He's the Messiah. He died and he resurrected just like he said. Just like he said. <laughs> so on the fifth day of his triumphal entry, Jesus and his disciples, they call into the Last Supper. And um, Jesus, being Jewish, celebrated Passover every year. Uh, but this one was different. The Last Supper was of the promise and that it was about to come. So Luke 22, 15 through 20, it says, And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds what? Fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gives thanks. The cup. See, the four cups became a cup. The Ten Commandments became a commandment. Jesus did not come to take those things away. We always say, oh, Jesus made it easier because through salvation we can do this and we can do that. No. If you read, Jesus says, I know you've heard that committing adultery, but I say that if you just look upon a woman in the wrong way, you've already committed adultery. That seems harder. That means more difficult. That seems difficult for me, right? I know you've heard, but I say. I know you've heard, but I say. Why did he do that? To show them their need for a Messiah. Their need for forgiveness, their need for, yeah, you may have followed the laws and you were pretty close to almost fulfilling them all, but now I'm going to make it harder. Not, to, not because I'm a bad God or because I want to make sure that you fail. You were going to fail anyway. Right. I'm going to do this so that you could recognize that you need me. You need a Savior. Because as long as you think that you could do it by your own works, my works will mean nothing to you. But it's not by our own works. It's by what Jesus did for us. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of, come, the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. New covenant, new promise, new and better promises. When he said, I've come to be the fulfillment, he said, I have come to be the last lamb. I'm it. After me, there won't be any need for this anymore. The last lamb. I am the lamb of God. After my blood is shed, there won't be any more need for this. I'm going to change everything. Still not what they were expecting. Because they wanted him to come set up his government and take all the Jews and say, we're in charge now. But he didn't just come for the Jews. He came for the Gentile 
and the Jew. He came for everyone on the earth. We said this the other day. I've said this many times. Some of you have heard it before. I said, you know, in the Old Testament, God was a God of the people. And that explains some of the horrible things that God had to do. Right? People, Sodom and Gomorrah, and, you know, there were women and children and, and, and all that there. God didn't celebrate having to do that. God was saving his people. If you had gangrene and you were going to lose your life or lose a limb, take the limb. Nowadays, you can just put a prosthetic one on and you'll be ready to go, right? They got stuff that you can, you know, they put hands on. It's incredible the stuff they do nowadays, right? See, God could not allow Israel to be destroyed by some of these Jews. He had to cut them off. It stinks. I know, and he didn't like it. He warned them. He gave them opportunity. If there be just one righteous among them, come on. He gave them every opportunity they could possibly have. But what did he have to do? He had to make sure that they did not contaminate the people because he was a God of the people of Israel. He was the God of Israel. Jesus dies on the cross, resurrects. And now salvation comes, one of the promises, right? Salvation comes, and now he's a God of the person. No longer the people as a whole, but the person. He is my personal God. He came to live inside of me. Me too. Right? I like to say, he, I'm his favorite. Right? God, God has a relationship, and he gave each one its own opportunity. No longer does he have to cut off, right? We, we always say, oh, well, God sends people to hell. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, way, I'm all over the place this morning, I know, but somebody has to hear this. Hell is not a place that God created to send people. Hell is a place that God created so you can pay for your own sin. If you choose to pay for your own sin, that's where you do it. For eternity. You know why I know that? Because the Bible says that he blots out the names in the Lamb's book of life. He doesn't write them in. That means that everyone's name is in that it's book. There. Yeah. For he loved the world. He gave yeah. his son, right? Everyone's name is in the book. Yeah. If you choose not to, to have salvation and not to, do, you know, to have him as your Lord and your king, then unfortunately, and he doesn't do it like, woohoo, this one's, you know, he doesn't do it that way. It hurts him. Why? Because he paid the ultimate price of dying on the cross for us. And we still refuse to receive that salvation. So what happens? We have to go. Somebody's got to pay for their sin. Somebody's got to pay. And he already paid. You don't want him to, to pay for it? Then you've got to pay for it. Yeah. And that's how you do it. Yeah. Yeah. So we say, oh, God sends people to hell. That is not biblical. Right. You end up there because you chose to. For 1,400 years, they would declare these four promises, but it never worked. They never fully came to pass. But Jesus is now saying that he, being the last lamb, was going to bring and has brought salvation, freedom, redemption, and fulfillment. I'm doing this. I'm the last lamb. You don't have to do this again. This Passover meal is going to turn into communion, and you're going to do it in remembrance of what happened, because what happened doesn't have to happen again. That's why it's a remembrance. It says, would you, you know, you're going to continue sinning. Would you like that, me, that we would crucify Jesus again? No, he says, I already did all that. It's already a done deal. Just accept what I've given you. Accept the things that I've done for you because I love you. No one loves you like Jesus loves you, that he would die on the cross. No one loves you like your father loves you, that he would send his only begotten son to die. On the cross. You cannot have God's promises outside of Jesus. He is the fulfillment of those promises as the last lamb. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Friday night, be here and we'll do this in remembrance of him. The Passover comes, becomes communion. So he took the cup and all the promises in him are yes and amen. And he turned it from the four to the one cup. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, New Living Translation says, Christ, our what? Passover lamb has been sacrificed for us. This scripture takes the four cups of our promises of old and makes them 
uh, brings them to fruition in his sacrifice. Our hope is no longer deferred, but our desire has come, and it is a tree of life. It is righteousness. And our opportunity to do something with this lamb is to share it. To share it. Do you not remember? If the lamb is too much for your family, invite your neighbor so that you can eat all of it so there's no waste. So nothing, we, we, we want to take advantage of the entire lamb. We don't want any of this not to be eaten, not to be taken advantage of. We want all of this to nourish everyone that you can possibly invite over to nourish them. John chapter 1, verse 29 says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There are three types and shadows in Exodus that connect what is the Passover lamb to what is the Lamb of God that John, and he was called that several other times. I'm only using that scripture right now. But the first one is the Lamb was perfect. Exodus 12, 5, the animals who chose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Without defect, perfect. First Peter 1, 18 and 19, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without what? Blemish or defect. The Lamb was sacrificed. Oh, you're getting some good teaching this morning. The lamb was sacrificed. Exodus 12, 6. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at, at twilight. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced. Now, this is, this is Isaiah prophesying of what was, to, what was already coming as if he was seeing it happening. That's what prophecy is, right? But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. He was slaughtered for us for these very reasons. And the last one is the lamb was shared. This is important. Listen up. Exodus 12, 4. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must. He's, he's setting up covenant with him he's saying they must share one with their nearest neighbor must second corinthians five nineteen, god was reconciling the world to himself in christ not counting men's sins against them thank you lord and he has committed to us say that's me the message of reconciliation in one version, it says, the ministry of reconciliation. I'm not in ministry. I'm not an evangelist. I don't, that's not my calling. I'm not anointed to go tell others about Jesus. No, no, no. He's saying that we all have a responsibility to share the lamb. We all do. We all do. So I want to end with that here today. It's time to share the lamb. Yes. It's time to share the lamb. I was speaking with a, a pastor I don't know, several months ago. And um, they, they, this particular church has still not recovered from COVID, and they're still kind of lingering around. The pastors, actually, he owns a business, so he's paying a lot of the, the, uh, the expenses of the church building and the things like that out of his own pocket to keep the church going. And uh, I was speaking to him and said, let's pray, and we prayed together, and, and he's... <laughs> And the, as I was praying, the Lord spoke to me, and, and, and I don't know, I haven't talked to him since, so I don't know if he's ever going to talk to me again, but um, I said to him, are the people putting the responsibility of sharing Jesus Christ on you as the pastor? Are they putting the responsibility of the church growth on you as the pastor? Because it's the church's responsibility to share the lamb. I know I do. I do it as often as I possibly can. That's all I did yesterday was talk to people out here and tell them to come to Easter and come to, and come to uh, you know, uh, the services we got coming up. You'll enjoy our church. It's really fun. Their worship is awesome. That's all I did out here yesterday. That's what we need to do. We need to step out of our comfort zone. And we have something it's a sacrifice, a gift that was given that could be given away, and you still don't lose any part of your gift. It's a Christmas message, I know.
but it, it's a gift. You got a gift that's Jesus, and as much as you give that gift away, it doesn't matter. You still have the same amount that you got when you got it. You don't lose your salvation by sharing, sharing it to somebody else. <laughs> it keeps, it's a gift that keeps on giving. Monthly jam, right? They send you little bottles of jam. I don't do anything. All right? The gift that keeps on giving. You're going to get a new box every month. And there was one I liked. There, there's this company that does uh, uh, Cuban stuff, and they send you. Are you okay? <laughs> you haven't said nothing. All service, and all of a sudden, whoa, she's all excited. <laughs> uh, I will have to, Mama something is called. Mommy's, mommy's something is called. La Caja de Mommy or something like that. And it's a little box, and every month they send you, and it comes with guayaba and Cuban coffee, and it comes with different little, you know, uh, uh, tres leche. It comes with different things that Cubans eat or whatever. And it comes with different things every month. You just pay a monthly fee. And, and I got that gift one time for, I think it was for like a year. And it was cool. I got stuff. When my dad moved to Oklahoma, I did it for him for a year. It's the gift that keeps on giving. That one's good. But after a year, it's gone. Because I'm not going to keep paying that. Right? I'll give you the one year. But that's it. You can go to mommy's uh, uh, <laughs> website and get it on your own. But Jesus is not like that. You know why? Because it doesn't cost us anything. It doesn't cost anything to share that gift with somebody else. Right? Share the lamb. It's part of our responsibility. He commands us to do it. He commands us to do it. So you have seven days from today. Invite somebody to, to communion service on Friday. Come on, the message of salvation is going to be preached between Friday and Sunday morning here. In a way that no one will be able to resist because it comes in love. Because God loved us. I know today there wasn't some parts that didn't feel like love, but love sometimes is like that. <laughs> right? But just know that the Lord was speaking to you and speaking to me. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Father. We praise you. We thank you, Lord. It, I know today's Palm Sunday, but I call it Preparation Sunday. It's the Sunday that we're going to prepare for celebrating your crucifixion and your resurrection. Help us to be bold in sharing the Lamb. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I pray, Lord, that these words and these promises will come to pass in our lives, Lord. You've already made them. You've already fulfilled them. All we have to do is believe in faith. Thank you, Lord. If there's anyone here that has never received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, the Bible teaches us, how do you receive this?